Sorry. What do you do? Sorry. That's people's work. You can't graffiti here. Don't you walk away from me. Hey, fuck you. Oh, you're a clever one. What's your name? Hey, everybody. It's Gamer Gramps here, and today I've got a Civ 6 Beginner's Guide for New Players to Gathering Storm. This video has a boatload of tips you can start using right away, and it's timestamped so you can even jump around or fast forward to a certain tip if you aren't new to the game. Or hell, just come back to it whenever you need to since it's such a long ass video. I'm going to be creating a bunch of brand new tips and tricks videos in the near future, so if you've got a great tip that's not in this video, I'd love to hear about it down in the comments section, and I'll give you credit in the future if I add it to one of my videos. The number of these tips is going to be wrong because it's a compilation video, but I went and added a bunch of updated information and my current insights into most of these tips so there's still something worth watching if you've been with me from the beginning. Speaking of being with me from the beginning, a quick shout out to Jackson Reeves and Steven Sadler who've been channel members here on YouTube for 27 and 43 months each. I honestly fully intend to quit my job and do this full time at some point and you guys are definitely helping me make that dream come true that much quicker. Enough rambling, let's jump into this. Alright, so three of the five tips in this video are going to be basically focused on the domination playstyle, so I figured we'd start with the two tips that can apply for every type of win condition first. Tip number one in today's video is going to focus on policy cards. Those of you who follow my channel probably already know this, when talking to a newer or casual players, I always stress the importance of properly taking advantage of the huge bonuses policy cards give you because they're probably the easiest and at the same time most powerful thing you can actually work on to make the jump to higher difficulty levels from where you're currently playing at. Relax, that isn't the tip, I swear. Once you start using policy cards more often and swapping them in and out on a regular basis, there's going to be certain times, especially in the early game when your culture output is limited, where you're going to want to take advantage of a policy card, but then you're going to be stuck with that policy card that's basically doing nothing for you for an extended amount of time, like 10 turns or something like that, because you have to hard tech the civic because the inspiration just is not a realistic option for you to get right now for whatever reason and it gets frustrating sometimes because if you're stuck with that card and who it's it's so important that you use it at the beginning but then it's not doing anything for you for the rest of the time it just seems like a complete waste when you could have a card slotted in that's going to help you throughout that entire 10 turns a perfect example of this kind of situation would be in the early game if you're planning to chop out a wonder in a science or a culture game or start chopping an army out in a domination game so you want to take advantage of the land surveyor policy card to get a 20% discount when purchasing some tiles because you're about to buy a ton of them so you can chop them but after you buy the land that card might as well be a dumpster fire because all of your gold's already gone and you're not going to be buying any more tiles anytime soon so the policy card is essentially useless at this point. So finally here is a helpful way to avoid this. Whenever you finish researching a civic and can change your policy cards you can go ahead and do that. So switch into whatever policy card you really want to use but isn't going to be much of a help to you after you use it and you don't want it to be stuck slotted in. For our purposes we're going to continue using the land surveyor card. So we reached a civic and put our card in and confirmed it's locked in. Now let's go buy all those tiles that we want to chop and save a bunch of money while we're doing it. There. Remember that every time you buy five tiles with this card on, you essentially get a free tile for the same amount of gold you would have spent in the first place. However, here's exactly what I was talking about. Now, we've used the policy card and are stuck having to wait an extremely long time before we switch out of the card because there's no way we're going to research the construction technology in time to boost the Games and Recreation Civic. So here's what we're going to do. Now, we're going to go and change our government from the chieftain we're in at the moment and move up to autocracy so that we can get an extra 10% production towards the wonders and all the bonus yields. And there you go. Because we switched governments, we get to go ahead and select brand new policy cards so we can now dump out land surveyors after we've already taken advantage of it and bought in all those tiles for cheap. And we're instead, we're not stuck with it being slot in for such a long time so we can replace it with a better card that we're going to get the most use of during that time. Obviously, there is a limit to how many times you can do this in the game. The easiest transitions are when you're moving up tiers of government like we just did from chieftain to autocracy or from autocracy to monarchy, etc. However, you can use this technique anytime that you research a new civic as long as you choose the cards 
use them, then switch your government afterwards. Keep in mind that if you switch to another government and then the next time try to switch back to an old government that you've already used, you get a penalty of three turns of anarchy, so you won't want to do this too often. However, Maybe you went into Classical Republic to get three economy cards and earn some extra great people points, but now you want to chop out an early wonder or two so you're going to switch into autocracy. That would be a perfect time to do it. Or maybe you're playing Domination and you went into Oligarchy because you were in an early war and wanted that bonus experience for your troops, but now you're at peace and you want to switch into Autocracy to get the 10% production boost towards chopping out the Terracotta army and getting all of your troops a free promotion. Another great time to use it. Like I said, there obviously is a limit to how much value you can get out of this technique, but that doesn't mean that adding it into your playstyle isn't worth it. Really, what do you have to lose? All right, so I definitely think that tip holds its weight right now. Like, it is crucial that you take advantage of policy cards throughout the game. Specifically, this tip itself works great still. And again, doing it when you're switching government types, that definitely is a valid option. I'll, like, modern day Gramps though would also add to this tip and tell you that another great way to take advantage of that tip that just lets you to do it more often is to simply save civics that you don't need switch into them for like when they have one turn till to completion or two turns or whatever it is like as the lower amount of culture is basically irrelevant once you get into the later stages of the game just quickly swap into it for a turn or two take advantage of the policy card that you want to quickly do that with and then as soon as you get that two turns later or whatever it happens to be just switch back into the cards you actually want to use going forward and this way you can do that tip a whole lot more often anyway let's jump to the next tip grams here i'm quickly interrupting just to say that if you're enjoying the video please do me a favor and leave a like on it if you haven't already it does really go a long way towards helping the channel get discovered and clearly you know it by now i'm special i need all the help i can get right anyway on to tip number two this tip is all about how to properly take advantage of chopping production into districts or wonders when the tile you want to place that district or wonder on itself has a lot of production like a stone or a forest that you'd like to chop into said district or wonder rather than piss it all away down the toilet or be forced to chop it into something else rather than the wonder or district itself. In a previous tip video of mine, I did cover this fairly well. The reason I'm bringing it up again is because recently a viewer of mine Shout out to Chris Neal, blew my mind when he told me about this. And I know, relax, it's nothing crazy, but small things entertain small minds, all right? But anyways, I'd always been under the impression that for this to work, you have to clear a production slot, which you do, by the way, that is true. But I always thought that I had to time it out perfectly with a building or a unit finishing production, so oftentimes I'd have Magnus get established, but still have to wait a few turns before doing the chop. Usually, this isn't the end of the world, but then there's sometimes those extra turns you have to wait would be the difference between you finishing the wonder on time or an AI sniping it on you and you being SOL. Now here comes the part that Chris told me about that is so much more convenient. Now, whenever you have Magnus established and want to chop the production from the tile into the wonder or district, all you have to do is go into the city's production queue. Keep in mind, this is the actual queue that came with Gathering Storm or whatever it was, not just their production list. So once you go into the queue, simply right click on whatever they happen to be building at the time and voila, no more production. Now you can feel free to chop that tile while you have nothing being produced, then place your wonder or district on the tile that you just chopped, and that chop's production will be added to your district or wonder. No more having to stress about timing things out properly or getting stuck waiting for a building or unit to finish. All right, so the only thing that I personally would add in here right now is that another thing you can do is hold down shift and press enter at the same time, and it basically forces you to end your turn. And that's another way of adding up the production and saving it to put it into whatever you want. And using that method, you can essentially like save multiple turns of production and dump them in into that project. So that's definitely something to keep in mind too for the, the people that are interested in doing that. But anyway, Let's jump to the next tip. All right, so tip number three is most often only going to apply to domination games or the odd time you're playing a science, culture, or religion game and you get doubt on or you spawn too close to another Civ and think you'd be better off killing them to quickly grab their territory. This isn't exactly a groundbreaking tip by any means, but at least by learning this, you are the one that gets to make the choice, whether you want to have an extra error score or whether you want to have a better chance of actually still having people to trade your luxuries and strategics to. 
So when you've taken over an enemy civilization and they're down to their last city, you basically have two choices. Either take over the city and gain plus five era score, but doing so is going to create grievances with literally every other civilization remaining in the game, or you can piece them out, taking basically all of their gold, all of their luxuries, and keeping what you've already conquered, but not getting that plus five era score, but also not stacking up all those grievances with the entire world. Most times in a domination game, you probably will end up just killing them to take the era score. However, if they're the first or second civ you're conquering and the whole world doesn't hate you yet, you might want to piece them out and let loyalty run its course. If the city flips to a free city, you're welcome to conquer it without generating the grievances, although you won't get that plus five era score. And by not generating all those grievances with everybody, you have a better chance to lock a couple of them into declared friendships, which will mean that you'll actually have somebody to trade all the extra luxuries you're going to be getting as you conquer the world, and the, the, strategic, the extra strategics that you don't need to upgrade your units. And if you aren't playing a domination, then if you don't desperately need the plus 5 era score in order to secure a golden age, I'd suggest you don't kill the city because the sooner you can lock your neighboring civs into formal friendships, the sooner you can relax and not waste production building a military other than to have the certain units you need to boost techs and civics and defend against barbarians. However, with all that being said, if you do decide to completely kill anybody in a game, another little tidbit of info here is to make sure that you conquer their capital city first and leave a different city to wipe them out with. If you take or burn all their cities and leave the capital for last, you're going to lose out on 4 era score points. If you take their capital and then kill them off, you get plus 4 for taking the cap and then another plus 5 for killing them, giving you 9 total. However, if their original cap is their last city, you only end up getting the plus 5 air score for killing them and you lose out on the plus 4 for forcing them to move from their original capital. Alright, so the only thing that I personally would add here, for domination games specifically, I would highly suggest that you leave them like that because it's much better off to take a peace deal and take the luxury resources and other gold and stuff like that in order to help you just snowball your conquest of the world right once you have your capital that's everything you need for the domination victory so unless it's like the first civilization that you're conquering where you you know you really really need every single one of their campuses or whatever like their theater square districts that you need to boost your science or culture up and get you caught up to speed on deity then highly highly recommend you taking advantage of peace deals that are going to help give you that cash that you need and give you those resources that you could then trade to other civs for that cash you need in order to just make your domination go that much quicker anyway on to the next one in time the final tip in this video is going to be about how to gain an advantage in a domination game by using a spy to help get some extra combat strength. A lot of newer players don't really use spies very often, or if they do, they don't really use them until the end of the game if they happen to be trying to protect a spaceport in a science game. Spies are actually an extremely powerful unit that can help give you a tremendous amount of gold income by siphoning funds in any win condition, stealing great works in culture games, or protecting your spaceports in science games. All that is great. However, they can also give you a nice little bonus in a domination game too. Similar to how having completed a trading post in an enemy civilization can give you plus 3 combat strength versus that enemy, as long as their city with the trading post hasn't been captured by you yet, a spy can do this for you as well. This is how you'd want to leave whichever city had the trading post in it as long as you could before killing it so you could keep the plus 3 combat strength. You want to send your spy to one of the furthest possible cities in their empire that you know about so that you'll have the advantage as long as possible. Once they're established in this city, simply run the listening post mission and you instantly have another plus three combat strength when fighting this civilization's units. And by the way, if the spy does end up getting promoted to a secret agent, he gives you plus two levels of diplomatic visibility, which equates to a plus six combat strength advantage. For this reason, if you are on a fairly even level tech-wise with whoever you happen to be fighting at the moment, I'd suggest sending the spy somewhere else to do the siphon's funds mission to help level them up a bit first before you do the listening post job. The reason I say siphoning funds is because of all the possible mission types that that one usually has the highest chance of completion, so you're less likely to have the spy be caught or killed. I'm not sure how experienced you are, but I'll put a link in the top right hand corner of the screen right now to a tutorial video I've done where it teaches new and intermediate level players the basics about how to plan your cities properly in order to have the most productive cities possible and how to make sure you're, you're putting your districts in the right position and how to use some thought and planning ahead of time so that you end up getting the strongest possible cities you can. It covers the whole concept generally and then I go specifically into each victory type and how to set up cities properly for that particular 
particular victory type and there's timestamps pinned at the top of the comment section so you can just jump through to whatever part you're interested in if you don't want to watch the whole video. I left that little blurb there about the tutorial that it mentioned in, in the video. I'll pin a link that has every one of the different tutorials that I may or may not mention as we go out through this thing so you can jump to them if you are interested after the fact. Anyway, let's keep rolling here on to the next one. All right, so here we go. The first tip we're going to cover in today's video is an easy way for you to save money when purchasing tiles and save production when building your districts in the early game. Now in a previous video I went over the district discount mechanic that can save you 40% of the production costs on districts with a little bit of foresight on your part but this technique is completely different and they can be used together if you wanted to. I've known for a long while that every time you research two techs or civics or any combination of one each the price to purchase land tiles, the production cost of your districts and the production cost of your city projects goes up. Until I recently played that 120 turn culture win without secret societies using the new magnificence Catherine, I never realized just how much of an impact this can have in the beginning and early mid game if you use a little micromanagement. So what you do is basically not research any tech or civic that you absolutely don't need right at the current moment in order to get your district of choice up online or improve any nearby luxury resources you want to trade right away. Research the ones you don't absolutely need right this second down to one turn left if you've already boosted them or one turn shy of that boost completion mark if you've yet to get the boost but know that you're most likely going to do so. By doing this you'll limit the amount of production required for your districts and while the first districts might only have two two or four production shaved off if you beeline for them right away, that can often shave an entire turn of production off the completion of your district in the early game if you don't have an ideal spawn location. And this obviously just compounds more and more as you continue to get techs and civics research and start targeting districts further down the line. Using this technique well into the classical era can be very effective and save you a lot of production and also gold when buying tiles for chops or really powerful yields. It does take a bit of practice to get used to doing it, but ultimately pays off in spades. The key is to still put the turns into the other techs or civics that you would normally get and having them one turn away from finish still ensures that they'll be easy to unlock when you need them for defense or are ready to actually start working on producing something that the tech or civic unlocks. Okay, so basically I have absolutely nothing to add to this. It's a good tip as far as I'm concerned and definitely suggest that you take advantage of it because the impact it has on your early game is really, really helpful. I mean, if you take a little bit, like maybe it's gonna take you a bit of practice and you have to try it a few different times, but adding this into your gameplay is going to make the world of difference especially in the early game which is the most important part of the fucking game you need to have a crucial understanding of the early game to set yourself up for success in the mid and late games the early game is where you should focus all of your energy and attention until you have it absolutely fucking nailed doing that alone will just improve your gameplay by leaps and bounds i can't even actually stress how big of a difference that could make to improving the way that you play this game a hundred percent anyway let's jump into the next tip here all right so this next one is going to be fairly straightforward and easily achieved well maybe not so much on dd if you're playing on dd i'd caution against using this regularly because oftentimes even waiting one extra turn can result in get you getting sniped by the ai and this is because the ai does target this wonder pretty much all the time in their various scripting so the tip itself is that if you're going for a science or culture game but haven't managed to secure yourself a golden age but you're near the end of the era and, and you're going to complete the great library beforehand but somehow you can't come up with the air score you need in order to get the upcoming golden age delay finishing it take it down to one turn remaining and then switch to building something else by doing this and then choosing the standard age version of the free inquiry dedication that gives you one air score for every eureka you achieve you can easily get yourself an instant five or ten air score right off the bat on turn one of the new era because of all the ancient and classical era eurekas that you instantly get when you finish the wonder. This is actually a significant boost and will help you a long way to making sure that you do get a golden age in the following era. Again though, I caution you against using this technique on DD too often. For instance, when I was playing this game specifically to get the footage for this video, I literally had it ready to finish on turn 49, which was the last turn of my era, but got sniped the following turn when the next era started and I wouldn't have completed it for the era score I wanted. All right, and 
And so, yeah, basically I have nothing to add to that. It definitely is a good idea. However, on the higher difficulty levels, deity especially, you're playing with fucking fire. So, I mean, if you actually don't have a problem with save scumming, I personally try not to do it. And I can't say I've never done it, but generally speaking, I don't do it. If you don't have a problem save scumming though, 100% use that all the time. Why not get yourself a bunch of free air score when you know that even if you get sniped, you can just reload the turn before and build it quickly, right? Just my two thoughts. Let's get on to the next tip here. Okay, so tip number three mainly focuses around culture games, but it can also be used in science games as well, because culture is an important part of winning an efficient space race. This is just a small thing that I'm sure a lot of people aren't aware of, so I figured I'd include it here, but don't expect your jaw to hit the floor by any means. Alright, so when you first start building art museums across your empire and you start earning your first couple of great artists, most people don't think twice about just popping all three charges right away in the same city since you have zero chance of theming any of your museums anyway until you get a lot more artists or you trade with other civilizations for their pieces. I myself fit this shoe perfectly for a very long time. I still did it this way hundreds of hours into playing the game and I honestly never gave it a second thought. But this is wrong. What you want to do is actually spread out your first artist's great works throughout any museums that you have online. When you spend that first charge, you'll notice that you get a certain amount of culture and tourism. However, when you spend the second charge in the same place, you actually get a reduced amount of culture and tourism from that piece because it's your second piece from the same great artist in the same museum. If you simply send him or her on their merry way over to your next city with the museum before popping that second charge, you'll get the full amount of culture and tourism again just like you did with your first charge in the original city. I do realize this is a small amount of culture and tourism we're talking about here, but every little bit does count, especially on the higher difficulties where you're playing catch up against the AIs for so long. Keep in mind this technique does naturally also make it a lot easier for you to get in the habit of theming your museums if that isn't something that you normally pay a lot of attention to. There is one exception to this though that I should mention as well. If one of your first art museums is in your capital where you have the palace, feel free to spend your second charge there before moving the artist onward and forward because if you put one piece in your palace and the other in the museum, you will get the full yields from both of them. The same type of exception applies if you're playing using the Secret Societies game mode and you chose the Void Singers. In that case, you could blow all three of the artists load in your capital and just put one in each of the spots already talked about and then the third into the spot at the old god obelisk and then going forward you could put two works in each city with an obelisk other than your cap until you have the right combination of artworks that you can actually theme your museums realistically it's not hard to transfer your great artists and stuff from city to city to do this so i mean why not get extra culture right all right so in an older tip for you i showcased the technique where you can use the combination of any range unit and a scout to bait the spearman out of a barbarian camp and then zip in to pop the hut with your scout as soon as he steps out. This next tip is similar to that but a lot more useful throughout the full range of a game. So the technique is to use civilian units to bait the AI into moving into a kill zone if you're on the defense or bait them out of their city so you can target the unit without it being protected from the city walls if you're on the offense. This is particularly useful for when you get about 60 or 70 turns into a standard game and the AI starts pumping out crossbow units. Obviously a builder is the ideal choice to use for the strategy however settlers do work if you happen to have one kicking around or manage to capture one from the enemy but don't have a nearby city location until after you finish taking them out what you do is set up your troops in a position where they're out of range of the enemy units but in position so that when you move your builder forward and they send a unit forward to steal it that that unit walks into a kill zone where your troops are ready to pounce alternatively if you're the one pressing the attack against the enemy you set your troops up out of range of both the city walls and any ranged units inside of the city but where they can attack the second ring of tiles out from the city move the civilian unit onto a tile in that second ring and end your turn more often than not the enemy will venture out to steal your unit and fall for your trap this can be even more effective when you have cavalry available to zip in to take the builder and zip back out allowing you to rinse and repeat this process rather than having to wait two turns to get the setup correct if you're using melee or ranged units to retake your civilian unit after taking out their captor 100 percent agree with this it's super effective to do i mean I mean, I guess some people might find it cheesy. You're sort of using like an exploit, but I don't think it's an exploit. Like it's a game mechanic, man. The AI is programmed to go after civilian units. Well, give them some fucking civilian units to go after, right? Like it's the same thing in war. Well, I mean, 
not really. <laughs> You'd like to think they're not targeting civilian units. And I'm not even going to start talking about Israel. Let's just fucking move on. So specifically talking about Civilization VI, it makes sense. You would prioritize stealing a settler from an enemy or stealing a builder from an enemy. I do that all the time in basically every single Civilization game I play. So I don't see what the problem is. Now with their captor. All right, so the last tip of the video is going to be a handy way for you to switch in and out of policy cards quickly that you don't want to leave slotted in for a long time. Good examples of this would be the Land Surveyor's policy card, which saves you 20% of the gold when purchasing tiles, or the Serfdom card, which gives you an extra two builder charges if you have a round of builders timed out to finish on the same turn, but aren't producing more after that, or have low production where it's going to be a lot of turns until the next round is ready to pop. So in a previous tip view, I already covered the technique that you can use government switching in order to pop a card in, use it, then change your government type on the same turn and get to reset your choices afterwards so you aren't stuck with that policy card in place for a long time. The problem is there's only so many times you can do this in a game without going into anarchy for switching back to an old government choice. The other way to do this that I think most people are aware of is that you leave civics that you don't absolutely need in your current game type like military tradition in a peaceful game or some of the dead end civics throughout the tree that don't lead to further options and you don't necessarily need. I want to give a shout out to Kip Bass who suggested this to me and it is very simple and yet I never actually put it into use until he mentioned it. In order to take advantage of quick policy card changes more often, simply research civics that you don't need in your playthrough like theology in a standard science game or also civics that you will be using but don't necessarily need the benefits they unlock right now down to one turn remaining. Then you simply leave them with one turn left until you do absolutely need to use them or you want to swap in and out of a policy card real quick. Pop the card in, use it, then one turn later you can swap back into actually useful and productive policy cards for the long haul. Like I said, Pretty straightforward and simple, and yet for whatever reason, I've never taken it that extra step. Okay, well, I'm not sure how experienced you are. I'm going to put a link in the top right-hand corner for the rest of this tip series. If you're interested, there's at the moment six. God, I'm pretty. <laughs> Anyway, there you go. I didn't realize that I actually like expand upon that earlier tip here like I did. So there you go. I did. And that's explained better than I quickly like suggested doing that. So hopefully that helps you understand it a little bit better for the newer players there. But anyway, let's just jump straight into the next tip here. Now. All right, here we go. So the first tip we're going to cover in today's video is a very convenient way to instantly get yourself a boatload of money. If you plan ahead for this, you can easily earn yourself enough to purchase at least one but sometimes two or three research labs or broadcast centers on that same turn or for that matter buy you a military unit or two or fun promotions or whatever you want if you're playing a domination game so the way to go about doing this is to use the policy card called public transport now i'll be completely honest i don't usually build a lot of neighborhoods in my games because i tend to try and win fast and i'm done with my games before they can really be worth the investment of production this is the exact reason that i never gave much thought to this policy card at all so what it does is it gives you gold based on the tile appeal that a farm has if you replace it with a neighborhood however the reason this is such a great policy card is that you don't actually have to build the neighborhood to get the gold you just have to replace the farm with the neighborhood considering that you normally have at least 10 to 15 cities when you reach this card you can clearly see how quickly that all that gold can add up so if for whatever reason you don't plan ahead and have all your cities ready, you can obviously slot this card in and out as many times as you'd like. So as you continue to get more farms with good appeal, you can take advantage of this repeatedly. I'll just say that if you are going to use it more than once, I definitely wait until you have at least a few different farms ready to be replaced before you switch the policy card back in. Otherwise, the loss of having a better policy card slotted in is going to severely reduce the effectiveness of using this tip. All right, so that actually I completely forgot all about this. So there you go. I would highly recommend taking advantage of the public transport policy card if you get to that stage of the game. I'm thinking about how, like, how much gold you would get, specifically if you use the new version of Cleopatra, the one that gets all the the bonus appeal near the river wetlands and stuff. <laughs> that would be a lot of gold. Anyway, let's get right into the next tip here. Okay, onward and forward. Tip number two is pretty simple, yet it is amazing nonetheless. So I'd expect that by now, most 
most people are aware of the map search tool. If not, you're welcome. <laughs> anyway, so I've known about this since that they added it into the game and I've used it on a regular basis. Definitely convenient for searching for world wonders or finding new strategic resources that you've discovered. I was happy with that and really enjoyed the improvement to the game's quality of life, if I'm going to be honest about it. But then, recently, I was actually told how to use this feature properly by a subscriber of mine and that's what I'm going to share with you now. So first off, thank you Ryan. This is much more convenient. So not only can you search for new resources, but you can filter it even farther. If you type your civilization's name first, it'll narrow the search to just your territory. This is so much more convenient. Not only that, you can do lots of things like search for hills in your territory to find out which of your cities is the best location for the Ruhr Valley and make it easier to count them all up. You can easily search for farms in your territory to see how close to boosting feudalism you are. You get the idea. The applications are literally only limited basically by your imagination. Anyway, I won't dwell on this for too long. As I said, very simple, yet amazing nonetheless. Okay, I think that's a great little tip there. I mean, it's not a game breaker by any means, but it definitely is convenient and quality of life stuff fucking adds up real quick. I mean, I couldn't imagine playing this game without certain mods. This is naturally built into the system and it's just nice. One little thing that I'd add here would just be that a good way to take advantage of that would be specifically when you're looking to get the boost for feudalism, which is having six farms in your in your nation if you're playing a domination game it would be really good to use that specific feature on your enemy to target an enemy that has a lot of farms so that you can get that boost that much quicker because it's important for you to get their builders out and i do think off the top of my head i think feudalism is a requirement to get to the mercenary civic which is super important because that's the one that gives you the 50 percent discount on gold and 50 percent discount on production policy cards for your troops. All right, on to tip number three. This one's, again, another short tip, but it can be very powerful if the right game conditions are met. Now, in almost all games I play, Magnus is usually the first governor I pick up. The next one being usually Liang for the extra builder charges or Pingala to start immediately working towards upping my culture and science. In fact, of all the possible governors to choose for my second pick, Amonity was <laughs> the least likely choice for a long time. All right, well, on this for too long. As I said, very simple, yet amazing nonetheless. All right, on to tip number three. This one's, again, another short tip, but it can be very powerful if the right game conditions are met. Now, in almost all games I play, Magnus is usually the first governor I pick up. The next one being usually Liang for the extra builder charges or Pingala to start immediately working towards upping my culture and science. In fact, of all the possible governors to choose for my second pick, Amonity was <laughs> the least likely choice for a long time. That was until I thought a bit about it and came up with this method for taking advantage of her. So basically, if in my game I end up getting several first meetings with city-states, at least three first meet envoys to even consider this, I'll, what I'll do is I'll change my normal routine. I'll grab Amani as my second governor. The reason for this is she's a great source of error score. So what I do is literally just rotate her between all the city-states that I have one envoy with and earn the two error score for becoming their first suzerain. So with this, you obviously have to pay attention because as soon as she's established in the city-state, you immediately want to move her to, the, to another one so that five turns later you get an additional two error score. You have to be quick about this otherwise the AIs are going to beat you to it and you won't get the two error score for being first suzerain because that's really all you care about. So basically you just rinse and repeat this as quickly as you can before the other civs steal their suzerains. One other suggestion though when you are using this tip, I would definitely pick whichever city state has the best suzerainship ability or yield bonus that you want and send Amani to that one last. That way she stays there and you enjoy the benefits of her being there in the long term and having two extra envoys for basically nothing other than a governor charge. Alright, I think that tip is pretty self-explanatory and I don't really have anything else to add to it. it it's definitely something to take advantage of, especially because there's certain strategies that it's crucial you get a golden age in order to carry them out properly. For instance, if you're playing a religious science game, it's fucking imperative that you get a golden age 
in the classical era. And I'm going to be doing a whole bunch of videos and studying on this 90 turn domination strategy with the new version of Cleopatra. I'll link to that in the comment section too, in that pinned comment. But using that strategy, it's also important that you get a golden age. It's not as crucial as a religious science playthrough, for instance but you're a lot better off if you do get the golden age than not. Uh, one other thing too, like to make this specific tip even more effective is if you're playing on the civilization, or sorry, fuck. If you're playing on the Secret Society's game mode, there we go, the brain work. Uh, just because you get that bonus governor promotion like as soon as you unlock your first secret society potentially so if you don't want to grab that specific secret society or you don't need it so soon i definitely suggest it all right now we're on to tip number four this is another short tip but it can make a very big difference when you take advantage of it so this is specifically for when you're playing science games this tip revolves around the second city project in the science game launch moon landing I'm not sure how close you pay attention to the fine print on this bad boy, but it gives you a one-time bonus of free culture that is equal to 10 times your science per turn output. Now I really do hope you always make sure to have both the 5 year plan and rationalism policy cards slotted in to ramp up your science output as high as you can. But don't worry, that isn't the tip. It should also go without saying that you should also go to every one of your cities with a campus and make sure that they have the maximum amount of citizens working in each campus before completing this project. Even if it is just for one turn but again that's not the tip the tip actually revolves around you building the Amundsen Scott research station wonder if you plan for it properly ahead of time you should be able to fairly consistently build that wonder right around the same time that you're gonna be finishing launching your moon landing project so the tip is to get the moon landing completed to one turn left yet hold off on finishing it until you've actually completed the Amundsen Scott wonder this way is because the wonder gives you that huge boost to your base science per turn across your entire empire which by that point in the game is a huge increase in your science per turn which is then obviously going to become a huge increase in the amount of free culture you're going to get from launching the moon landing now i should say that normally i personally won't wait for more than five turns for this to line up properly because i'm anal and i want to win my games as fast as i possibly can if you can't get the completion of the wonder and the finishing of this project to within 10 turns of each other i'd probably suggest you just say fuck it and say better luck next time again though make sure you do the other things I did mention so that you can at least have the most free culture you can earn for this time around if it doesn't line up the way you would have wanted it to. Again though, this little tip is a great way to help you boost past those tricky civics at the very end of the tunnel that are sometimes hard to get the uh, inspirations for. Like the one that I always struggle with, no matter how hard I plan for it ahead of time, I always manage to fuck it up, but it's the, the, the boost for globalization where you have to build three airports. I always try and I've yet to literally get it in time before or I actually surpass it by using other means. Anyway, let's just keep moving here. Yeah, honestly, I don't have a whole lot to add to that tip either. I definitely think it's a good idea and it definitely helps you getting your science wins that much faster. If you want to get good at Civ 6, subscribe and hit the bell to keep up with this channel. A lot of new players struggled to defend themselves from the AI attacking them in the early game. One of the worst culprits for doing this is the Persian civilization. They're a notoriously bad neighbor to have and are famous for rolling over new players dipping their toes into the higher difficulty levels for the first time. Well, the first tip in the video is going to help solve that problem. Persia is literally scripted to be likely to declare a surprise war. Sounds bad, I know. Well, the flip side of that coin is that Cyrus also likes civilization who declare surprise wars. Believe it or not, even people who declare surprise wars on him. When you first meet Persia, I would suggest moving your unit away so it doesn't die, and then declare a surprise war on him the following turn. In 10 turns, he will almost always make peace without a fuss. The positive impact you receive from triggering his leadership agenda actually outweighs the negative impact from declaring war on him very quickly. It should go without saying that you only want to use this strategy at the very beginning of the game, preferably in the ancient era when there's not it's not going to generate grievances towards anybody else, but you can usually get away with it in the classical and even sometimes the medieval era too, uh, without it ruining your reputation with the other civilizations too, too badly. So if you do end up deciding to do this, unless you inadvertently trigger some other agenda he has, he will be happy to become your declared friend before you know it. 
If you want to speed this process along, pay for open borders the turn that you make peace with him. This will help improve your relationship, and after a couple turns, you should be able to send him a delegation, which will help increase things even faster, and before you know it, he'll have the green smiley face and you can declare your friendship. All right, so this tip definitely still works. Uh, it's as a feature of the game. It's not a glitch or a bug or anything like that. Another way to take advantage of this specifically with Cyrus in domination games, and this is great too, which gives you a civilization to trade with that'll be friendly with you, is to not attack Cyrus, but just sneak attack somebody else in the early game, which, I mean, you're going to be attacking somebody in the early game anyway in domination, right? By doing that, you trigger his friendly ability here. Here. you can declare a friendship with him and keep that going throughout the game and then just kill him last and that way you can trade all the different strategic resources that you don't need the different luxuries that you're picking up all that shit you'll have somebody to dump them off with because he'll be more than happy to pay you gold to take them off your hands right this added little tip here sure that's just for cyrus but it realistically goes for any of the ai leaders in the game whatsoever if you can manage to just end up declaring a friendship with them early on you can keep that going throughout the game and you have somebody to trade with until ultimately you come further throat anyway let's jump into the next tip here on to tip number two this is the first of two tips concerning using policy cards to good effect in this video I think most players who have played the game for a while know how important the Feudalism Civic is to prioritize because it unlocks the Serfdom Policy card which gives all builders you produce an additional two, <laughs> an additional two charges. For newer players, I'll briefly explain how important this is. Builders start with three charges normally, so this card almost doubles the amount of charges you can do with each builder for the same investment and production it would cost to get you your three charge builder. Now don't worry, using the Serfdom Palsy card is not the tip, although I'm sure there will be a few newer players who didn't know about how important it is until now. The tip is to use some foresight and plan ahead in order to fully take advantage of the turn you first unlock Serfdom. The first policy card in the game that affects builders is the Ilkum Palsy card, and this beauty gives you plus 30% production when constructing them. That's a really big deal. The problem is that as soon as you reach the Feudalism Civic to unlock Serfdom, which gives you the plus two charges, the Ilkum Policy card disappears from the game. You lose the chance to take advantage of the plus 30% production until way later in the game when you unlock the Public Works Policy card. However, what you can do is actually pre-build as many builders as you have cities before you reach Feudalism. To do this effectively, you simply put the Ilkum Policy card on to get that plus 30% production bonus and then start making builders in most if not all of your cities now this does require a little bit of micromanagement because you have to pay attention to the timing of all your different cities what you watch out for is when a city is one turn away from producing the builder then jump to the city and switch production onto something else rinse and repeat this process until you have all the cities you want one turn away from the builder and then go ahead and finally unlock feudalism. You can switch into the serfdom policy card and then go back to all those cities and have them finish the builders. In two turns, you'll have almost all those builders done with an extra two charges on them. So there's two things to keep in mind when you're doing this. The first is to remember that you can do this at multiple times in the game before you reach feudalism in case you don't want all of your cities producing builders at the same time. You can do all your cities in two or three different batches if that's more convenient. Just switch in and out of Ilkum as you need. The other thing to remember is that you need to switch back into your builders the turn that you discover feudalism, not the turn before you do. This is because your builders would finish and be produced at the very beginning of the turn, which would be before you actually have the serfdom enabled, so they wouldn't receive their bonus two charges. Yeah, I think that's a powerful strategy. It should be used in every one of your games realistically. And uh, yeah, nothing to add. Damn, I did a pretty good job. Anyway, let's get to the next tip. Talking about timing your builders properly is almost a perfect segue onto the next tip of the video, which is namely to talk about lining up timings consistently. This is an extremely important topic that in all honesty probably deserves its own video to do it justice, but we're going to do a condensed version today. There are a ton of different timings to pay attention to as you progress through the game, and the more you learn about them and memorize them, the easier they are to recognize, and taking advantage of them 
will definitely help you win games faster. The first one I'm going to talk about today is an extremely important timing when it comes to winning a science game faster. What you need to do first is decide which kind of economy you're going to develop, either a faith economy or a gold economy. This choice dictates whether you use Reina or Moksha in this timing. What I'm talking about is timing out your research of the rocketry technology with having one of those two governors sitting in whatever city you want your first spaceport in and having the foresight to make sure that they have four governor points sunk into them. One to actually recruit them and then three more to get them to their respective promotions which allow you to purchase districts. I can't stress how important this is. The amount of time you shave off a science victory by nailing this timing is huge. Just don't forget to save up enough of your desired currency first. You'll need 7200 gold or half that much faith, 3600, to instantly purchase your spaceport. The next timing I'm going to bring up is one that's very important in order to win a religious game as fast as you possibly can. The Mohabadi Temple is basically essential if you want to get a fast win with religion. What this wonder does is give you two free apostles, which are over 400 faith each to purchase normally. This is an unbelievably huge advantage because you get your first apostles on their way to the closest neighbor with a religion so much earlier. It should go without saying that you want to use magnets to boost chops and make sure you have the corvée policy card slotted in while chopping in order to get this wonder fast. Those aren't the timings I'm talking about though. The most important part to really take advantage of how powerful this wonder really is for a religious game is to make sure you have Moksha fully promoted with his ability to grant an extra promotion to apostles and have him established in the city producing the wonder before it is actually produced. This timing is very powerful but surprisingly easy to achieve if you put a little planning into it. Basically, you have two governor promotions to play with before having to sink your next four into Moksha to have him promoted in time. I should say, you have that many promotions if you're planning on building a government plaza and its first tier building. Otherwise, you'd have to just only pick Moksha right away, and I'd really advise against this. For my two promotions, I almost always go with either Magnus and his promotion where you don't lose population for settlers, or I go with grabbing Magnus for his chopping bonus and Liang for her bonus builder charges. The odd time I might choose Amani over Liang if I have Yerevan in the game because they are godly, and having their suzerainship before unlocking this timing is like a wet dream. If you successfully pull off this timing, you get the two free apostles very early in the game, and because of Moksha's promotion, you get to choose a second promotion for each of these apostles. This greatly increases your chance of getting at least one of them to have the debater promotion, which is a really big deal when it comes to easily wiping out heathen religions effectively. The last timing I'm going to discuss today can be used to help give you a great start to almost any type of victory, other than standard domination games. I think that most people generally go the route of the foreign trade civic into early empire as most times it's going to be faster since finding a second continent is often easier to do than getting an early builder and having the proper tech to improve three tiles without wasting gold to purchase extra tiles too early. So while you're going down that route in culture, make sure to at least unlock mining and possibly bronze working if you prioritize getting the Eureka by killing three barbarians. When you unlock early empire, you choose Magnus as your first governor. Now, you have to decide where you're going to build your first wonder. There are only three that are realistic to choose from on Didi difficulty, but on lower levels you obviously have more options. On Didi though, two of the options are extremely dependent on your starting location, while the third is almost always a possibility. The first two choices are the Pyramids and Temple of Artemis, which are both very possible to achieve, yet are dependent on the terrain tiles that are more unlikely than our third choice. The third choice is the Oracle, and it's easier to reliably count on because all you need is a generic hill to build it on. The timing in order to su successfully get these wonders in an efficient manner is to have Magnus waiting and established in your target city. You also need to build a builder or two up ahead of time and, and have them ready and waiting to chop as soon as you're ready. The timing is then to pivot in a civic tree over to state workforce before you begin chopping your wonder when you unlock the corvée policy card for that extra 15% production boost to your wonders. You'll almost always be successful in attaining these wonders on DD difficulty if you use this timing method properly. Yeah, honestly, not a whole lot to add to this one either. Uh, 
timings are very crucial in every aspect of the game i have to say though i haven't played a religious game in a long time but seeing that kind of makes me want to do one so i think in the, in the somewhat near future here we're definitely going to try another just straight up pure religious win because i'm already planning on a religious science playthrough because it's been forever since i did that and i prefer religious science economy games over strictly gold-based science games so some things to look forward to if you're going to be following the channel here in the near future the fourth tip i'm going to mention today is a great way to save yourself some time when you start building your mid-game wonders that have 720 or more production i think it's fair to assume that most players choose classical republic for more peaceful games or or <laughs> towards wonders. Don't get me wrong, we aren't going to waste this opportunity by switching into the government as soon as we get political philosophy and using it for one of the early wonders. They are easy enough to get on their own by just using the Corvée policy card and some good chops with Magnus. What you want to do is hold off on this government type until you unlock the techs or civics you need in order to build a good mid-game wonder. Some amazing choices to use this tip on is the Kilwa Kisawani, Forbidden City, or the Patala Palace if you're playing a science or culture game, or the Hagia Sophia is a great choice if you're going for a pure religious win. What you do is simply time things out so that you have Magnus established wherever you plan to build your wonder and some builders in place waiting to do your chops. Then, you time it out so that you jump into autocracy, Chop the wonder out real quick, taking advantage of that extra plus 10% production, and then switch immediately into a different form of government. The reason you want to time this correctly and do it quick is that you don't want to be stuck in that government for an extended period of time by the time you actually make your way to the correct text or civics for the respective wonders you've chosen to target. Also, don't forget to make sure to have the correct wonder building policy card slotted in. You need to make your way to the divine right civic which unlocks the monarchy government but also gives you access to the gothic architecture policy card which helps medieval age wonders. The nice thing about needing to get to this policy card is it gives you a higher level government to jump back into once you take advantage of the increased wonder production that autocracy gives you while you make your way through the civic street to unlock exploration so you can get into merchant republic. Alright, last but not least today we're going to talk about the land surveyor policy card. This is going to be a very short tip because it's very simple. Quite frankly, you need to use the fucking policy card. I think almost everybody who plays the game is aware of this policy card, but I think I'd also be safe to argue that most beginner and even quite a few intermediate level players don't use it as much as they should. I'll be the first to admit it, I was really bad at practicing what I preached for a long time. It wasn't until somewhat recently that I began focusing on using this card as much as I can and really started to fully understand how powerful it is when used and how easy it is to use it frequently as long as you simply plan ahead and use it properly. This card allows you to buy 5 tiles where normally you would only be able to grab 4. That's powerful in and of itself, but that's only if you want to use it for buying another tile. That 20% you save might be just what you need to upgrade another slinger to an archer in the early game, or save you just enough cash in the mid game to help purchase that luxury you want to grab to help out with your amenities. So very simply, what you want to do is just save your gold for the 3-5 to five turns until you have the policy card in, then buy in bulk to save more money. As you get into the habit of doing this, it's easier and easier to remember, and obviously the more you do it, the more you'll get to enjoy the rewards of using this policy card effectively. Generally speaking, unless you have some crazy awesome tile that you need to get hooked up immediately because it's so powerful, or you need to quickly buy tiles that are bordering with another civilization, you should try to slot this card in anytime you're going to buy land. Alright, so that was short and sweet, just like I like them. Effective, that policy card is one of the strongest ones in the game. Honestly, highly recommend you use it as much as you possibly can. But anyway, let's jump into the next tip here. Channel. Alright, first things first. Calling these tips pro is definitely an exaggeration. Don't be discouraged though. If you aren't already using all of these tips, you definitely should be if you want to be as effective at playing the game as you can be. Enough beating around the bush though, let's get to the tips. Alright, here we go. The first tip I have for you is a creative way to get around an extremely annoying problem that I can't believe there isn't a better solution for. When you're playing any type of game other than domination victories, your city-state suzerainships are very crucial to winning the game as fast as you can. 
In my humble opinion, I can't think of a single thing in the game that pisses me off more than when some douchebag AI decides to declare war on one of my city-states. It pisses me off even more when said AI is a declared friend or worse yet, an ally and you can't do anything about it. Or can you? I'm happy to say that tip number one is a workaround for this annoying problem. It's a relatively quick fix and is pretty painless to pull off as long as you have a few hundred extra gold kicking around and you happen to notice them getting attacked early enough. This is obviously a lot easier to do when you're in the mid to late game and have an abundance of gold rather than in the very early game when you're usually spending every penny you bring in. What you do though is levy the city-state's military. Most times they'll have at least five units, give or take one or two. All you do is move their units into the tiles directly leading to their city so that it can't be invaded. Because the units are technically yours for 30 turns, the AI can't physically get to the city-state to capture it. Even if they bring in ranged and siege units, they can blast the walls away all they want, but the city, and more importantly, your bonus science, culture, or faith, are safe and sound. Worst case scenario, you secure your suzerainship for another 30 turns minimum. More often than not though, the scumbag AI will end up making peace with the city-state before the 30 turns passes and you'll avoid losing it altogether. Alright, on to tip number two. This one can come in handy when you're trying to play a peaceful game and don't have much in the way of the military, or when you're running out of turns before an era ends and you need to secure that golden age before it's gone. What you do is use a scout and a slinger in a combination to instantly wipe out a barb camp without even having to fight. All right, yeah, pretty straightforward tip. Don't really have anything to add to it whatsoever. I mean, <laughs> other than the fact that it's years later and it still fucking pisses me off when the AI tries to go after my city states. I mean, it is what it is, right? I honestly, though, I really hope Civ 7 has a function where you can diplomatically tell them to fuck off. I don't understand how that's not in the game, to be completely honest. If I'm the ally of a city-state and I'm allies with you, why would you attack my city-state? And if you happen to attack it, if I told you to stop, why would you not stop? Or better yet, to add like more complexity and shit to it, if I told you to stop, sure, you don't have to stop, but if you don't want to lose the alliance status and start a war, then you better stop. You know what I mean? Anyway, rant over. Let's just jump into the next tip. All right, on to tip number two. This one can come in handy when you're trying to play a peaceful game and don't have much in the way of the military, or when you're running out of turns before an era ends and you need to secure that golden age before it's gone. What you do is use a scout and a slinger in a combination to instantly wipe out a barb camp without even having to fight. This can also be done with any other unit, even a slinger and a settler to be completely honest. Not that I'd suggest trying that though. I should note, this obviously doesn't have to be a slinger. It can be any ranged unit at all, whether it's an archer or a field cannon, etc. later in the game, if it'll have the same effect. The bread and butter of this technique is that you move whatever unit you choose to clear the camp with onto any tile immediately adjacent to it. Once you have your unit in position, you simply move your ranged unit into view of the barb camp, but leave it one tile away. The barbarian unit will automatically leave the safety of the camp in an attempt to go kill your weak ranged unit. As soon as it moves out, you simply move into the camp and get your arrow score without having to fight at all. Keep in mind that the unit you move into the hut will probably be attacked by the surviving spearmen, but you can simply run away if you don't want to fight and kill it. Unless you were stupid enough to do this with a settler, of course, in which case they're going to capture it from you. For those more inclined to get their hands dirty, the Scout-Slinger combination is a great way to get your Eurekas for bronze working and archery at the same time. With a little bit of finesse, it's no problem for a Scout and Slinger to double team and finish off a lone Spearman. There is an exception to this trick though. If the Barbarian is already severely injured, they won't always leave the camp to pursue your ranged unit. Also. Remember that Spearman has to have a clear line of sight on your range unit. It won't work if there's a rainforest or something else blocking the unit's vision. That's a super straightforward tip, nothing to add other than it's really fun to do to get them to chase your slinger and then grab it with a scout. I mean, it's the best of both worlds, right? And again, I'd highly suggest you trying to kill it with the scout and the slinger, especially if it's early game and you haven't boosted archery or bronze working yet. It just makes sense, right? Moving on, the next tip is about chopping production from a great tile into a district or world wonder. I honestly didn't even know about this one until the past month, if I'm going to be completely honest. I honestly had no clue it was possible to do this. 
So you have a great district with a huge adjacency bonus, or the perfect spot for your world wonder picked out, but shit, there's a beautiful piece of stone or a nice forest you want to chop for a ton of production on the tile where it's supposed to go. This isn't really a big deal if you have something else really important that you can chop the production into, but this isn't always the case. Not to mention, if it's a really important wonder to your win condition, sometimes the production from the tile you build it on could be the difference between you getting what you deserve or a scumbag AI sniping the wonder on you. So here's how you solve your problem. What you do is have the city produce anything. And I mean anything. It can be a slinger, a research lab, you get it. Anything. The key is that you need to have finished producing something and had a clean slate on the city production list. The city needs to have that little gearbox icon next to it if you look at it from the main game screen. Now, you have the builder go ahead and chop whatever tile it is where you want to place the wonder or the district while the city is building nothing. Then, go ahead and plant your desired structure in place. When you look at your production screen, it'll say zero out of however many hammers needed to complete. Don't worry. Go about the rest of your turn like normal. Once you get to your next turn, all of the production that you chopped from whatever resource was on that tile will be applied to whatever it is you decided to produce. If you have Magnus already established in the city, his bonus does get applied to whatever wonder or district you plopped down. Honestly, clearly this has been covered quite a bit in this extra long video already. However, I purposely left this in here just because I think I did a good job of completely explaining the process the first time around. So just keep in mind, in order to make that specific tip more effective, you can just use the Q in the updated version of Gathering Storm so you can clear out your production list a lot easier. But then also you can use Use shift and enter to force your city to save its production until the next turn. So to properly explain this, what you'd want to do is say in Kyoto here, we are planning to build whatever the fuck we're planning to build there. And it's not going to be ready for three turns. Instead of for three turns working on a builder or a settler or something else, like whatever you were going to plan to dump that production into, what you can actually do is complete your whole turn. And then when you're stuck on Kyoto, when you're supposed to choose production, hold shift down and press enter at the same time and it forces you into your next turn so you could literally just continue to do this to build up your production and then dump that in into the world wonder or the district or whatever you have your heart set on but yeah anyway i'll shut up here and let's jump to the next tip moving on to tip number four this one's a real doozy no it isn't it's a small tip but very practical and considering how many turns you have in a game where you change your policy cards in and out it can add up and have a big impact on the result of your game the tip itself is to make sure that you always take advantage of whatever policy cards you currently have slotted in before you go ahead and change your policies after researching a new civic sometimes it's easy to get excited you got the civic you've been waiting on for a while and you just jump right in and switch to whatever policy card you unlock because it's a really powerful one for whatever win condition you're chasing i've done it more times than i can count believe me but have you ever stopped to think about what you're leaving on the table it can be something as small as leaving your survey card online when you move all your scouts before switching policies which allows a scout to get that last bit of experience for his promotion so now he can move over hills or forest tiles and helps you earn error score faster. Or it can be more important, like leaving your land surveyor card functioning while you get those two luxuries improved and sell them off for gold which allows you to buy some needed tiles to chop. Leaving that policy in place saves you 20% which lets you buy a fifth tile to use instead of the four that you would have gotten without it. Not to mention having that wonder production boosting card functional for the one last chop needed to produce the wonder you need before the scumbag AI snipes it on you. But then, being able to switch out of that card for something actually useful instead of having it be stuck in place for however many turns it is until your next Civic is unlocked. Enough examples though, hopefully you can see where I'm going with this one by now. Okay, last but not least we're on to tip number 5. This tip is basically only useful in the ancient era, although sometimes you can do it in the classical era as well under the right conditions. Just be careful though, because you'll generate 50 grievances with each civilization impacted by your decision. A nice thing about this is that there are no grievances generated, even though it says there will be, you haven't met the AI who's going to get pissed. With that being said, even if you do know them, 50 grievances is like spilled milk. It's nothing you can't overcome and have a healthy relationship with the AI, even on DD difficulty. Anyway, on to the tip. So you're playing your game and you end up meeting a city-state, 
Better yet, multiple city-states that are going to be crucial to giving you the boost you need for your win condition. There's a problem though, they have shitty envoy quests that you're definitely not going to complete, like build an encampment when you're going for a religious win, or recruit a great general when you're playing a peaceful science game. Problem solved. Well, problem solved as long as the city-state doesn't happen to be in your immediate vicinity. As long as you have a little bit of breathing room between you and the city-state so that their army doesn't take a walk and start giving you problems, you can easily get rid of that bunk city-state quest they wanted you to do. All you have to do is simply declare war on them. That instantly wipes out whatever quest they were asking you to do. And don't worry, you can instantly make peace 10 turns later. City-states are not like other civilizations who won't always make peace with you unless certain terms are met. They are more than happy to not be at war with you. Better yet, there's no grievances with city-states either, so it's not like they're going to hold it against you in the future. Worst case scenario, you lose out on a first meet envoy, but this can be more than worth a sacrifice considering having a quest like build an encampment and prevent you from earning any easy envoys from that city-state for the rest of some games. Just don't forget to make peace with the city-state before your era ends, otherwise you'll be boned for the following era's quest as well. Your wanting tips to elevate your game and take you to the next level? Stick around. If you want to get good at Civ 6, subscribe and click the bell to keep up with the channel. Before we get going here, I guess I should start out with a little disclaimer. I don't consider any of the following tips to be game breaking or shady by any means. I think mechanics like storing your production so you can instantly build things goes past the line for me though. I even go as far as saying that's basically the equivalent to playing with cheat codes enabled. But hey, that's just my opinion. I'm sure there are going to be people out there who might might feel the same about things that I'm about to mention in this video, so don't use them. Or better yet, be sure to tell me how I'm a horrible person and I suck at Civ 6 down in the comment section. Alright, now that we have that- <laughs> Salty Gramps. I like it. Alright, now that we have that out of the way, let's get you your tips. These aren't in any specific order, just thought I should mention that too before we get going here. So the first thing we're going to show you today is an effective way to boost your gold per turn income. This method is obviously a lot more effective if you're playing a somewhat peaceful game, but can still be used in domination games. As long as you have spare strategic resources or have just moved further along in the tech tree and don't need a certain resource for your armies. The first thing you need to do in order for this to work is to bring the AI standing gold count down to zero. You can specifically target an AI whose treasury is low, or choose just about anyone and use your luxury resources or trading your diplomatic favor to put a big dent in their bank account. Before you go and waste your resources though, you need to make sure that the AI is actually interested in whatever strategic resources you have to trade them first. You find this out by offering to trade them one unit of the resource. If they're willing to pay anything more than one piece of gold for it, then you're good to go and this strategy will work. In my experience, AIs who are more aggressive like Cleopatra, Alexander, and Amanatori, for example, are more likely to be interested in your strategic resources. Also, they're by far more likely to stay interested in the resources after they've gotten the minimum amount needed to use for creating a unit. So when you find an AI who wants your strategic resource, preferably who has very few, and in a perfect world, no copies of the said resource at the moment, trade until they have no gold left. Once they are at zero gold, you simply offer them one copy of your strategic resource at a time. While this can be irritating, it's definitely worth the investment of your time if you ask me. The AI will trade you one gold per turn for each copy of your strategic resource you offer in this way. They'll continue to do this until you've reached the amount needed to make a unit, generally 20 is when they lose interest, or they have no more gold per turn income to trade you. When you're searching for AIs to use this trading method, it's best if you can manage to find one who's interested in more than one type of strategic resource that you have. This way, you don't have to get multiple AIs gold stockpiled down to zero in order to trade away your excess strategic resources. As I mentioned, this technique is most effective when you're playing a fairly peaceful game, ideally after you have your neighboring AIs locked down and are safe and sound. You definitely don't want to be caught with your pants down by a hostile neighbor and not have the strategic resources you need to create the units to defend yourself. <laughs> All right, so quickly to freaking talk about the number one tip here that we just went through. Anyway, to quickly talk about it again, in hindsight, I actually find this pretty shady. Like, I wouldn't do this today. I mean, I could give a fuck if you do it in your game. Same thing with the shift enter thing. Like, I tell you about it because do it if you want to. It works. But I just personally don't do it because I think the shift enter thing, like, has got to be a glitch. I mean, maybe it's not because it's still in, still in the game. For me, 
that is just a little bit too far. But even this now, I'd happily trade my strategic resources for money and stuff, but like to nickel and dime for one gold per turn seems a bit devious. But again, to each their own, you do what you want. So the next tip is basically going to be me expanding on what I just mentioned. No, not more about trading strategic resources in that way, but about locking down your neighboring AI so that you can stay safe and sound. If you're trying to win with either culture, science, or a diplomatic victory, it's usually most effective if you can manage to avoid going to war. This is because the production and investment of turns it takes for you to build armies can be put to better use helping you achieve things that are relevant to your chosen victory condition. By far, the easiest way to go about your business in peace is to declare friendships with your neighboring civilizations. Declaring a friendship gives you a guaranteed 30 turns on standard time settings where that AI can't attack you no matter what. You're free to piss them off by forward settling them, breaking promises, attacking city-states they're suzerain of, you name it, and they can't do shit about it. What you might not know though is that once you've declared a friendship with an AI, you can lock down that friendship for the entire game. Even if you've generated grievances against that civilization, they'll still maintain the friendship with you no matter what kind of shit you pull. The key is that you have to pay close attention. As long as you notice the friendship has expired on the exact turn that it does, the AI will automatically accept another declaration of friendship despite any grievances they have against you. This only works if you manage to catch it on the exact turn it expires though. If you don't notice until the following turn, you're gonna be shit out of luck if you done things to piss them off. Now, if you're new to the game, you might be thinking that sounds nice and all, but how the hell are you supposed to get them to declare friendships? Generally speaking, this is pretty easy to do. First and foremost, you want to send a delegation to them on the very first turn you meet in AI. This is the only turn where they are guaranteed to accept your delegation. After that, they'll reject it unless you've done other things to establish a positive relationship with them. Another thing you can do is simply send a trade route to the AI to improve your relationship. You can also give them gifts. If you gift an AI 100 gold, it almost guarantees that they'll be more interested in friendship. I don't know about you, but I don't consider myself to be above good old fashioned bribery. Last but not least, the most effective way to improve your relationship is to trigger an AI leader's leadership agenda. This part comes with more experience as you play through the game. Off the top of my head, doing things like having cities with high populations near Eleanor of France, having a lot of districts works great for getting a good relationship with Nubia, building lots of cities helps you with Rome, and sharing any luxury resources you have with Monty of the Aztecs will get you on his good side. Every AI has multiple agendas that if you satisfy them will go a long way towards making them receptive to your offer of friendship. You can always check to see the first agenda they have on the main page of the diplomacy section. You can reveal their other agendas later on in the game, but to do this you have to increase your layers of diplomatic visibility. If you're enjoying the video so far, do me a favor and take a second to hit the like button. It goes a long way to help a small channel like me get discovered. Better yet, leave a comment on here. Call me an asshole if you want to. Any engagement helps. Anyway, let's get back to what we're here for. All right, so for this tip here, 100% is a good tip. I would definitely suggest using it. The only little thing that I have to add, the tidbit to throw on top of that pile, is that in today's current game iteration, as in March 2024, the AI doesn't necessarily always accept your delegations even if you do send them on the first turn however like nine times out of ten they will so it, that still does apply it's just not automatic but when i recorded this tip video once upon a time ago that was automatic so just something to keep in mind but other than that it definitely still works and i'd highly suggest taking advantage of it for new players especially too if you are curious in order to learn these secret leader agendas you can just literally google it maybe you know what leave me a comment down below if there's enough interest i'll actually make a video quickly going through all the different leader agendas maybe that'd be something that people would watch but i personally wouldn't so i don't know if there's enough interest out, out there or not but anyway round enough let's see what this next tip is here next up we're gonna talk about diplomatic favor this tip works for every type of victory condition you can try for other than for a diplomatic victory for obvious reasons in case you don't know the AIs will trade for your diplomatic favor like it's crap they literally can't get enough of it they will almost always be willing to trade you between 9 and 16 pieces of gold for each point of diplomatic favor also something to remember is that they'll trade you more gold if you offer them multiple points of diplomatic favor in the same trade. For instance, an AI who's willing to pay you 10 gold for one point of diplomatic favor 
will almost always agree to pay you 29 gold for 2 points. As you start to trade Diplomatic Favormore, you'll stumble into AIs who are willing to pay you an even higher premium for your favor points. At first, I thought that was based on the civilization's lack of interest in war. Two that I find this to be the case with was Pericles' version of Greece and China. However, after playing a specific game to test this theory for this video, I found out that isn't the case. My new theory is that it's depending on whether or not they happen to be chasing a diplomatic victory in the game, but I have more testing to do before I can say this with any certainty. One thing I can say for sure is that all of the AIs are a lot more willing to pay more for diplomatic favor the closer you get to the end of your current World Congress session. This basically goes for every civ in the game as far as I can tell. Ultimately, you're going to have to make a decision for yourself whether or not you think trading your diplomatic favor to basically have a crazy high gold income is worth not having any sway or very little when it comes to the World Congress sessions or the opportunities to participate in or call for emergencies. I think that 9 times out of 10, this is a trade that I'm more than happy to make. The only time I get a little bit salty is when the opportunity to boost production in my chosen victory types buildings by 100% comes up and I can't force the vote in my favor. With that being said, there is a way that you can have the best of both worlds and have lots of diplomatic favor to sell off for insane gold income and still have plenty left over to force your ideal world congress choices or defend yourself against an AI who's getting close to a diplomatic victory. That's coming up towards the end of the video though, so stick around. Won't be too much longer. Yeah, so pretty straightforward here. I'd highly suggest you take advantage of this. This is a very strong thing to do. And realistically, the gold that you generate from this is super important. They've refined the game since I made this tip more, where generally speaking, the AI doesn't value it as much as they used to, but they definitely still do. You just have to wait to the part of the game where they actually value it, which is like when you hit the classical stage of the game or medieval, maybe it is whenever the first world session starts that's when they start valuing it is right around there so it's a good thing to like stockpile your shit early and then sell it off while it's an advantage right anyway on to the next tip moving on here your next tip is going to be a pretty simple one to be honest it's to really start paying attention to the quest the city-states offer you in every era. This was honestly a part of the game I didn't really pay a whole lot of attention to for quite some time. Now that trading diplomatic favor can have such a huge impact on your game though, I basically do everything I possibly can to achieve all the quests city-states offer in an era so that they reset and offer you an additional quest every time the era moves ahead. It goes without saying that you should prioritize completing quests and becoming the suzerain of city-states that help your particular victory type, whether it's religious, scientific, culture, etc. But sometimes, they just have absurd quests like build an encampment in the ancient era when you're going for a science win, and it just doesn't make any sense for you to do that. In this case, just do whatever you can without taking a hit to your win condition. For instance, becoming a suzerain of an industrial city-state in a science or culture game can be a great thing because it'll help you build certain wonders faster. But even if you were to take that bonus away, it would still be worth it just to gain the diplomatic favor point per turn you earn for being suzerain of them. If you put a little effort in, you can essentially guarantee becoming suzerain of at least one city-state in the ancient era. This is extremely effective if the city-state has a nice bonus for your win condition, but still, a huge boost even if it doesn't. A suzerainship is essentially an income of at least 10 gold per turn, which in the ancient era and even parts of the classical can essentially mean doubling your gold per turn income, which definitely comes in handy. It's because of this being so powerful that I've totally changed around my early game starts as far as civics go. I basically always pursue foreign trade into early empire so that I can gain access to the mysticism civic and earn myself the envoy that comes along with it before I change gears and head towards craftsmanship and stake workforce. A great early one wonder that you can pursue to ideally gain control of at least two or three city-states in the beginning of the classical era is the Oppendana. It's unlocked for you when you acquire political philosophy and is essentially easy to build consistently in your games as long as you target it fairly soon after you get the Civic. The amount of gold this can unlock for you throughout the game, especially if you do end up building another wonder or two in your capital later, is definitely worth the investment of production and or chops needed to secure the wonder for yourself, in my opinion anyway. 
The only thing that I have to add to this tip is that in the current iteration of the game, Apodama is hard as fuck on higher difficulties. Like if you're playing on Deity, chances are you're not going to get it. I'm just going to like level with you basically. If you are one of the players who is playing on lower difficulty levels, then highly suggest you go for that wonder. It's wonderful. But even on Deity, you do get it sometimes. So it is worth it to chase it as long as you have a plan B that you can kind of throw that production into. So tip number Number five. Well, honestly, it's basically a wonder and not a tip. It's officially called Orzagaz, I think. Don't quote me on that. I honestly just refer to it as the Orgasm Wonder for the reasons I'm about to get into. So this beauty of a wonder was introduced with Gathering Storm, but I honestly think it's flown under the radar as far as popular wonders go. Machu Picchu, the Golden Gate Bridge, and the Panama Canals kind of stole the show in my opinion. So what Orzagaz does is literally doubles the amount of diplomatic favor points you earn per turn for being suzerain of a city-state. That's crazy good in literally every type of win condition you could be going for. Whether you want to just sell off all the diplomatic favor points like I do, or you want to sort of get the best of both worlds and sell some and save some for the World Congress, or if you happen to be chasing a diplomatic victory and want to use all the diplomatic favor to control the World Congress, this wonder is a fucking beast. It's unlocked with the sanitation technology, which is something you're going to be getting anyway in most games to get the sewer for increasing your city populations or to unlock the door for chemistry tech for your research labs if you're going after a scientific victory well that's all i got for today I sin well there you go there you have it that's all he has for today and that's all i have for today i hope you found these tips helpful and if you did there's some links to check out pinned at the top of the comment section that could definitely help you out further so check them out if you're interested other than that though i'd like to hear from you if you have a minute down in the comment section what tips do you think would help new players to gathering storm get better faster than i missed out or even on top of that like which tips in this video have you found the most helpful it'd be interesting to hear but yeah anyway i'm gonna shut up i'll see you next video